Today we're going to talk about how to read chain damage. Damage in different places means different things. So we're going to use this pile of shame. These are all chains that I've discarded for various reasons. They just couldn't be saved. So we're going to go through and have a look at them and explain what's occurred and why they're not salvageable. The information we're going to use today comes from a Oregon manual. The reason we're using this one is because it's still available from Oregon's website. I'll leave a link in the description. I highly encourage you guys to go and look at it on their website or download it in a PDF. The information contained within there isn't as complete as some of the other manufacturers' manuals over the years. However, they're the only ones currently offering something like this. I'm not trying to sell Oregon products in any way. It's just a very helpful guide that will help anyone, no matter the brand of saw or chain or bar or whatever you use. The information is very universal. We're going to start off by talking about witness marks. First off, we'll use the most obvious ones. The chain I'm using as an example here is Oregon EXL because I believe the EXL and the TXL actually have the best ones of these around. So the majority of manufacturers will just give you a straight line across the back here, which is very helpful. Oregon's done it a little bit better. It stands out. This is the most common sort of witness mark that most people will have, and it's there to help assist you to maintain the correct filing angle. You can use it as a reference as you're filing through. You can see it. It also exists to tell you the limit of the chain. Once you've worn back to that point, it means you're done. All right, so here we are looking at the side witness marks. These witness marks exist to try and show you the correct side plate angle to use on your chain. Most manufacturers will just give you a line. This is where I think Oregon has done really well on these EXL and TXL series chains. They have covered it in a more detailed approach there. So these witness marks just exist to tell you if you're on the right track. After you're done sharpening, you can look at the top and look at the side to see if you are on the right track. If we look further forward onto the depth gauge, that's where we get one that indicates a wear point. They are listing that, they are showing this little line here to show you the maximum depth they expect you to go with the depth gauge. That's a wear indicator, and that's what we're going to be dealing with next. We're going to have to swap chains because honestly, there's one clear front runner in showing details about wear, and that is still. Still is the undisputed kings of giving you wear marks. This is a still 404 semi chisel skip chain, so a 46 RMF. You can see our witness marks on the side are just that line, that's the most common. Not all manufacturers give us them, but a lot of them do now. What sets still apart is the detail they give us in our witness marks. If we look at our depth gauge, it is sloping forward on approximately a 10 degree angle because they're indicating the shape that they want the depth gauge to have. All the versions of this chain with the more straight up and down depth gauge at the front actually show us the curve in the witness mark. They give us witness marks and wear indicators on the lower of the chain. There's not many manufacturers that do this. You can see here we've got a line coming through the cutter's toe, the front section. It extends up into the notch here where it drive off a spur sprocket. And we also have it carrying on all the way through the back here, through the cutter's heel. This gives us our best indication we're going to have of when a chain has been worn out from the bottom up. Still is by far and away the best at this. A lot of people may be questioning why, but I'm hoping you can see as these move through the very faint bits of uh, marking you can see on the bottom. This chain hasn't had a this chain hasn't had much use, but it's had enough that you can start seeing it becoming shiny. That's because the underside of the cutters and the drive links run on the bearing surface that is the bar rail. It's only lubricated with some oil. There's obviously a high friction area, so that's why we get wear from the underside. All right, so let's start with the horror shows. I cannot show you any mild abrasion damage, but I can show you some severe abrasion damage. So what we have here is it's knocked the corner off. Hopefully you guys can see the shiny metal all the way over there. Heavy, heavy abrasion damage down the side. So this is from hitting foreign objects. You will not get this level of damage from hit just cutting wood. This is the kind of thing that takes a lot of effort. You need to hit rocks and then continue to try and cut. It's obviously severe damage to the chain there. At least another thing that isn't covered in this manual. 
If we look at the top of the depth gauge, it's highly polished. There's a lot of scrapes running back in the direction of the chain. This is because after that corner has been knocked off, they've tried to continue to cut. They've applied a lot of force to the saw, to just pushing on it, trying to create and make it cut. That ramps the top of the depth gauge up into the wood and it polishes the top of it. So that's what's occurred here. This sort of thing generally leads to a lot of damage and the cutters heal, which is explained a little bit later on. The next few things are pretty basic. It's to do with our filing angle. People will use too much angle. It'll make it cut very fast, but dull extremely quick, or they'll use not enough angle. But really low angles when you're trying to cross cut, just makes them cut really poorly. They won't self feed. It's just a bit of a nightmare. The generally accepted range for a round file is between 25 and 35 degrees. It's just what works. So stick within that range. Doesn't really matter which angle you pick, just make sure they're consistent throughout all of them. Okay, here we have our classic heavily backslope cutter. This is a result of using a file that's either too large or holding the file too high. Most commonly referred to these days on the internet as a ski jump. It's just wording that was used and become popular. This is a great way to kill chain. So what will occur generally here is very heavy wear through the lower part of the cutter heel. It'll wear its way back up to the rivet. This is an odd situation. If this chain had come to me and it was worn back to the witness mark with the correct filing, I would say that the person that used this chain, especially if they're using a hard nose bar, used this thing perfectly. This is a level of wear I'd expect when the chain is worn all the way back. It's reached the point of the witness marks. It would be perfectly acceptable for this chain to be in this condition at the end of its life, especially here where we're cutting very dense hardwoods. Wearing the underside to that point would be fine. There's not excessive wear down on the drive links. There's none of that going on. It's only in the lower part of the chain. If you run hard nosed bars, they're more than likely to wear in sort of an arc between the two rivets, just due to the way it goes around the nose tip. So yeah, this one's died early in its life. If it had been filed correctly and it made it to that witness mark, they would, I could have said, good job, they've done well. But they've killed this one early. You can see just how far the undersides are worn. It's gone back past the witness marks, or at least to the witness marks for the most part. This is a sort of where you'd expect from a heavily used chain at the end of its life. That sort of underside wear occurring earlier in a chain's life is a real problem. And that's what I'll show you next. What we're looking at here is probably the most expensive chain mistake I have ever seen. This chain is a still RD3, so it's a tungsten carbide chain. These chains are extremely expensive. And it has been killed before it has ever been sharpened. It occurs a bit with these carbide chains. People have this belief that you can cut just about anything with them. What they've done here is forced it to cut well and truly after it was blunt. So the reasons that this can't be salvaged. If we look at the rear, it has worn past those witness marks up into the bottom of the rivet. Since they have used a lot of force to try and make this cut when it was dull, it has continuously rammed that heel down very hard into the bar rail and has worn it completely out through there. This chain has a significant amount of stretch. It cannot be tensioned on a bar that is suitable for it. The other issues that have occurred, this, this chain should have the little oil dimples in the side of the drive link. They have been wiped off. It is a 63 gauge chain that has worn the lowers below 50 thou. It will never stabilize in any bar. There is too much movement in the rivets and it's highly likely to crack and fracture up to that rear rivet if you tried to use it. This is a couple of hundred dollar mistake here. I'm not sure what these things are worth in the rest of the world, but a 20 inch loop of this is just over $200 here in Australia. So I've never seen someone kill a chain this expensive so early in its life. It's a shame I was hoping to be able to salvage this, but yeah, it is absolutely destroyed. So again, this is why you do not try and force a chain to cut. When it is dull, stop, sharpen it. It still has wear left in the front. It obviously wasn't doing anything in the toe. The bar they're running it on obviously was in reasonable condition. It probably isn't after it ran this chain, but it wasn't terrible. So there we go. That one's just an expensive mistake. 
Here we have a still 3 8 RM chain with a bunch of cutter life left in it. The problem is this chain cannot be used because of down here. This chain was killed by a bar that did not have enough rail depth. It has wiped the bottom of all of the drive links. It's done it quite significantly in a few places. The section I've put up here at the minute isn't that bad. You can see they're worn completely flat or maybe even slightly concaved up. This is an issue due to bar rail depth. This is why there's minimum depth requirements for bar rails and why you should check. They put a essentially new chain on a very worn out bar and just wiped it out. If it wasn't for that, this chain is usable. Um, but because of that lower section, you can't replace every drive link on it, not in a cost effective way. So this thing, it's just junk. So this one's slightly unique in the fact that this wasn't because of the errors that they had done with the chain previously, although you can tell by looking at the lowers it is worn out the lower side. The top side is pretty much worn out. I bought these chains as a batch of used ones. Some of these were heavily rusted. I cleaned them up as best as I could and then tried to see what I could make work. So this one broke a tie strap in behind the rivet there. This failure it was due to a tight rivet. Because it had been rusting and sitting for a while, it didn't free up very well and that's the cause of this issue. That's why it snapped. The first time it went around a sprocket, it cracked and broke. So if this chain was in better condition, if the lower wasn't as heavily worn, you could just put a joiner link in there and continue to use it. This brings up another point. If you do add new links or a joiner to a chain that is in this condition, you need to file the lowers. You need to get the height of the links the same as the rest. Or otherwise, you'll break it again around one of the rivets. It needs to ride at the same height as these on top of the bar groove. Given there's not much left on this and I really don't need any more 404 chain, I never salvaged it. I just keep it around to demonstrate a few things. Okay, this one is very unique. So there was issues with bar rail uh, depth. It's worn the bottoms. But what has killed this chain was actually a nose sprocket failure. The only reason I can think of is how this has occurred. If you look at all the rivets, you can see they've got a big gouge out of them about halfway up. This most likely has happened when a nose sprocket has failed and allowed the chain to drop down into the nose, splitting the end of it. Keep this one around because it is very unique. I don't have anything else like it. So the next part of this is really difficult to show. Here we have some chains turned inside out. So all that lower wear you can see from the sides is due to this part of the tie straps and the bottom of the cutters running across the bar rails. That's where that wear comes from. The other thing we need to look at from the underside is the condition of the actual drive link. So what we're looking for in an ideal world is for these to maintain the same thickness from the bottom of the chain here to the very tip. What occurs when they become dull or they're sharpening correctly is the chain wobbles in the bar groove from side to side. And that's how we end up with this tapered shape that forms. It's thinner at the end. You'll notice on chains where people are better at sharpening one side than the other that they'll wear heavier to one side. When that occurs, the chain knows it will no longer sit flat in the rail. It'll always be able to wobble more to one side than the other. This causes extremely rapid bar wear. So these two are an example of that. They're not the best examples I've seen, but they are here. The one on this chain is unique. They all actually lean to the same side. Whoever was sharpening this was much better at one side than the other. And it's caused heavy wear through these. It's very difficult to get it to show up, but it's more thinned on one side than the other, and it drifts off to one side. A chain that has got to this point in its life isn't salvageable. It'll never run in a rail correctly. If you do put it in a bar, it'll wear the bar rails, the lower section of the bar rails, which you cannot do anything with. Once you've damaged that lower bit, that bar is junk. I'll make a video probably next week showing damage to bars, what is repairable, what isn't, what to look out for. But this is just an overview of some of the different types of chain damage. This is stuff you can look for. Throughout your chain's life, just keep an eye on it, look at it. Inspect the lowers, inspect the uppers. 
every so often just make sure that things are working as they should. In a perfect world, they'll end up with wear that occurs through the bottom, but you will be able to use the entirety of the cutter before they wear past an acceptable point. If you're still trying to cut when it's dull and all those sorts of things, then yep, you're going to wear excessively wear the lowers and the drive links before you get a chance to get the full life out of the chain. I highly encourage everyone to get a copy of that Oregon Safety and Maintenance Manual. It's available on their website. You can look it on there or you can download it. I'll leave a link in the description. There is a lot of very valuable information in there for everyone using a saw. Even people that probably should know better will probably learn something from it. It's not the most detailed book, but it does give a lot of very good explanations. It'll help you get much better value for money out of your cutting equipment. The most important thing to keep in mind, it doesn't matter if you have the world's greatest chainsaw, the world's most powerful, whatever. What really does all the work is the bar and the chain and the sprocket. Looking after them is the most critical part of making your saw have a long and happy life. You can get by with a below average chainsaw if you have an above average knowledge and skill set related to chain. It is far more important. You take the best saw in the world and put a below average chain on it and it's going to be crap. You take a below average chainsaw, put a great chain on it and look after it well and you'll be able to do a lot of work. Everything will last a lot longer, it costs you less money, it's much easier work for you. So I highly encourage everyone to learn a few things about this. It'll make your life a lot easier. But that'll do for today. Next week we'll get on to bars. I don't have many. I don't have that many bars with severe damage, but I do have this, which has got all the classic signs. It's even lost a rivet. So we'll touch on all of that next week. And then I'm going to take this bar, which is in very bad shape, and the chain that suits it, which is in extremely bad shape. I'm going to go and show you what it's like trying to cut with that, and then I'm going to fix it. I'm going to make it work. We're going to use some basic tools, and we'll make it happen. That's the job for later on.